are our help. Nothing can stand against us. Even the gates of hell could not prevail if you but stand with us. We pray that. We ask that in the name of Jesus. Stand with us, God. Correct us where we err. Strengthen us where we weaken. Direct us in everything that we're involved with. And yes, Father, chasten us as your children to bring us back into right path. We pray your blessing, Father, in this time of study and prayer and separation that you help us get our mind right and our spirit right that we might go in this community and be the very presence of Jesus to our world. We pray for these that have been named. We acknowledge those that have been prayed for silently and have been acknowledged by hand of faith, but we would especially pray for, we raise Father, our children, our young people. They have such a short time that as they grow up to be influenced for you. And we pray your full salvation for all of them. But we ask that you use us as faithful witnesses and help us to speak a right word or to live a life of example that others would want to know Christ and be in this relationship with you. We pray for our congregation. We pray for the denomination. We pray for this upcoming general conference. Most of all, Father, we pray for your kingdom, that it would begin in us. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> we uh, look today at 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. This is the most dangerous assignment. Because if you're like me, you already have such a strong emotional issue that for you, you've already, you've already thought you have got this passage down pat. Mm -hmm. And both of my marriages, I had uh, the pastor read 1 Corinthians 13 as part of the service. First time, I didn't know he was going to do it. He just did it. But the second time, I... I requested it because it seemed like it worked well the first time and you don't want to mess with something that works. But there's more to it than maybe what we have previously seen. I have mentioned several times in your hearing that you really need to start that passage at least half a verse before chapter 13. And if you're being honest continue on at least one verse on into the next chapter. But even that's not sufficient. If you look at Paul and his writing, to understand what's going on here, you have to understand that Paul argues his points in very specific ways. He's nothing if not consistent Reminds you of anybody? <laughs> Good or bad, I'm consistent. And, and he's the same way. He just always Paul. In chapters 8 through 10, he addresses uh, meat sacrificed to idols and, and, and eating that. And uh, he <laughs> introduces that question. Again, when you read Paul, you're reading something very much like the game show Jeopardy where you've got the answer. And you backtrack and come up with a question that logically fits the answer. And so the answer in chapter 8 is about meat sacrificed to idol. And he introduces that topic, but midway he presents two examples for the church. One positive from his own behavior, that's chapter 9, and the other one negative, and that's the nation of Israel, <coughs> chapter 10. And then at 10.23, he reintroduces and gives a conclusion. And so you introduce, give positive example, give negative example, and then conclusion. That's what he does in 8 through 10. 
Well, guess what he does in 12 through 13, uh, through 14? In chapter 12, and we've previously discussed this, in chapter 12, he introduces <coughs> spiritual gifts. And then he gives a positive example. That's chapter 13, love. And it's if he's continuing in the tradition that he started when he's talking about meat sacrifice to idols, his is the positive example from his own heart, from his own life. And then he gives a negative example, and that is his restriction or his rules on uh, the speaking of tongues. It's not so much a negative example as the fact that it has to be more guarded than any of uh, of the other spiritual gifts, primarily because of the way uh, the church at Corinth has had people practice that gift and cause division. And then he concludes uh, with spiritual gifts in chapter 14 uh, at, at the bottom of that. And so you've got this idea that chapter 13 is primarily an example from Paul's own life as an apostle of Christ, positive on spiritual gifts. What's the most positive spiritual gift he can offer? Love. Now, as I already said this morning, you really want to look at least, you can't read this chapter without reading at least the last sentence in chapter 12. And that's after having been reminded that really all of chapter 12 introduces it. But he says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And then he starts the familiar words of the love chapter. But then look at verse 1 of chapter 14 as being sort of the conclusion of that. Pursue love and strive for the spiritual gifts and especially that you may prophesy. And so he continues with this idea of prophecy, but what is, what is, the, what is the end goal for the church at Corinth? Pursue love. So now after having said that, that's the entire message except for us looking at the idea of what is love biblically. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoings, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I am, I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought and the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. We've said before, and we continue saying that in this chapter, you have only action as a descriptor for love, never feelings. And I re-raise that idea today because what I see in, in the world is that we mistakenly look to, to feelings when we talk about love, and feelings get in the way of what true love is. Um, 
in the prophet Jeremiah at chapter 17 verses 9 and 10 we've got an understanding of of love or not love but of feelings it's described as the heart the heart is devious devious above all else it is perverse who can understand it question mark I the Lord test the mind and search the heart so that's emotions and intellect the mind is intellect the heart is emotions I the Lord test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways according to the fruit of their doings and so there you've got this idea that emotions are not trustworthy and yet if you go out and talk to our teenagers about love it will never ever cross their mind that love is anything but a feeling and to make love is purely sex nothing here is listed sexual because when Paul talks about love he's talking about his behavior as an apostle and it's always rooted in the idea of how he acts in this first section he gives you in a poetic way his understanding of what he's done he Paul as an apostle but with the clear understanding that if his motive wasn't correct none of that behavior counted if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels and so that's talk that you can understand and that's speaking in tongues if I do both but have not love I'm just making a noise if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge he says over in uh, 2 Corinthians that uh, I know a man whether in the body out of the body I do not know who was caught up to the third heaven pause third heaven is the highest level of heaven Uh, anything above ground is the first heaven what we would call the atmosphere would be second heaven and the actual presence of God would be the third heaven I know a man caught up into the third heaven whether in the body or the body I do not know who was shown things mysteries beyond all knowing whether into the body out of the body I do not know and then he says he he knows this man but then he says to keep me from becoming conceited I was given a thorn in the flesh so he obviously is the man who was caught up into the third heaven he's telling us he is the one who has revelation from God and he he describes it here as understand all mysteries and all knowledge well whether he actually knows everything I mean if he would rival Google I don't know but whatever he has in the way of mystery whatever he has in the way of knowledge the use of it for the purpose of the body of Christ is without any value if it is not done in love and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains Jesus said you know if you had faith you could speak to this mountain say be removed and it would get up and jump if I give away all my possessions if I hand over my body so that I may boast but have not love I gain nothing not a thing there in his example of himself well then then he shifts from the example of himself verses 1 through 3 at verse 4 he talks about love just outright it is patient kind not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude does not insist on its own way all these things we've heard time again usually in a very poetic language can I tell you it means nothing unless it's applied and it's meant to be applied in community this is the church we can talk all we want to but unless our actual behavior lines up with what Paul is giving as a descriptor of love our behavior is without value now why am I making such a big deal out of this because we've allowed 
love to be defined as emotion, we've, we've turned to various behaviors that have been previously considered sin and are no longer. Um, a married male homosexual who uses the title reverend working for our bishop in Nashville posted uh, a, I would call it a cartoon the kids call it memes it shows Jesus and disciples and he posts this on Facebook publicly and had many clergy liking it or sharing it it says from Jesus the difference between me and you is you use scripture to determine what love is and I use love to determine what scripture is now this is this is leadership in our denomination in our Episcopal area by someone who uses a title he's not entitled to to promote a behavior that's specifically forbidden in our book of discipline. It's based in feeling. Mm -hmm. I feel certain things and therefore it's right. I feel certain things are wrong and therefore they are wrong. In that illustration, who's God? My feelings. Mm -hmm. That's one reason I am so strict in my own life looking at scripture. I don't want to define my relationship with God. I want God to define it. How could I have any hope otherwise? But this this is this is common. Um, the liberals can't wait to to win general conference next month. They've already started announcing that uh, they're going to take they're going to redefine our stand on abortion to say that we bless abortion and. Routinely, routinely, I see so-called ministers of the gospel, end quote, on Facebook, blessing abortion clinics and blessing the practice. Hebrew scripture, Old Testament, talks about people worshiping the false god Moloch and sacrificing babies to Moloch. How is that any different from today? Feelings, as Jeremiah quotes the Lord God, are more deceitful than anything. I love you not when I feel an affinity for you. I love you when my behavior expresses what's given here in Scripture. And it, it finds out that my feelings are irrelevant. Jesus said where your heart is, there your treasure will be all also. Our heart doesn't follow what we value. What we value follows our heart. We place our heart in, in Scripture and find out that that becomes our valuation, our treasure. So, again, I speak against feeling and I speak towards a behavior that's biblical-based that isolates what I feel in the moment. You know, guess what? My feelings shift so rapidly. I can be angry at somebody in one minute, and the next minute just, well, enough about my relationship with my daughter. <laughs> you know, I'd be ready to strangle her in one minute, and then she'll say, Daddy, I love you, and all oh, right, right, whatever you need, you know. You know, every time I put my foot down, it gets moved. But uh, that's behavior based on feeling. The third section here, Paul says that there are three things that last forever. Eternal, many translations. What that means is those things will be in heaven. You know, if, if all that we know is reality is just preparation for us to be in the presence of God for eternity, the only thing that passes from here to there are the souls that belong to God, the people that belong to God, and then what he calls faith, hope, love. But which is greatest? 
That's how we prepare for eternity. Faith is believing something enough that our behavior is affected by it. It's not just an intellectual assent. When we join the church when we think we believe something, but if that belief doesn't change your behavior, it's not real faith. Faith, hope. Hope is the assurance that in God, everything will be okay. I quoted uh, on Facebook yesterday from uh, J.R.R. Tolkien that the resurrection means that in Christ everything bad will one day be undone. Don't you love that? That's hope. In Christ, the resurrection means that everything evil, everything bad, all that we regret, everything that we fear, all of that, one day will be undone. It'll just come apart. Hope. But love, Paul says here, is greater than even faith and hope because it's what allows us to relate to one another as God has related to God in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and therefore how God has related to us. That's my thought on the subject. What are your comments or questions or your thoughts? I had three comments on this this lesson and I didn't write them down and I can't remember <laughs> that. <laughs> and that's pitiful. Oh my. That's pitiful. I can't remember one of them. But I had three things I wanted to lift up and it's gone. Just like that. <laughs> well, my my motto is if it's not written down it never happened. <laughs> and sometimes it never happened even if I do write it down. Yeah. It's uh, Frightening thing. You can't remember something that was so important to you. It'll come back, Granny. Yeah, I guess. I guess. In the middle of the night. Yeah. Usually. <laughs> and, and, and write it down and then wait till next Wednesday yeah. and we'll take yeah. it up. I and mean, there's no reason we can't take it up next Wednesday. Yeah, that's true. It's not like we're going to forget love. That's true. That's true. Anybody else? Kind of tells us to search everything we do. The purpose of why we're doing it. We're doing something for somebody. We need to search and make sure we're doing things in love. <coughs> Sometimes we're not, but just do it. For me, that goes back to what Paul says to Timothy about the Lord loves a cheerful giver. If you're not happy about your tithing to the church, keep it. <laughs> not, do, not, not doing you a bit of good. Oh, my. The Jeremiah uh, that you quoted, it's so strange that, like, what, 50 years ago, I remembered a verse from Bible school and all, and it's strange. It's Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And why would I remember that all those? <laughs> that is so strange. It that's, really is. that's the way our memories are. Um, yeah, that is strange. Everything that I preach without notes on Sunday morning, I learned 30 years ago or more. Because if I learned it yesterday, chances are I've already forgotten it. Mm -hmm. That's just reality. Mm -hmm. It's one reason I'm consistent. I don't remember enough to be inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. <laughs> Well, it feels like I came to an abrupt stop, and yet I did cover everything I intended to cover. Again, Paul's close in chapter 14, 1, that first phrase, pursue love and strive for the spiritual gifts. You know, that's pursue is, is, is stronger than Strive. The first thing is to pursue. That's the universal gift. But it's okay to go after the others too, but you make sure that that first one is locked in. 
Anyone else? There was one thing I, I did want to mention and didn't have anything to do with those three things I wrote down because I still can't remember them, but uh, finding um, the depth of love can come, come about so simply by just getting to know a person and particularly in the community of Christ is that you can go and worship side by side by people every week and not experience the love that you have for them when you are sitting down with them one on one or as in a group like we have and get to know each other and that love just explodes Amen. and if we could take that and make that really be what we're about and then bring that into worship I think people all over Decatur County would hear us on Sunday morning in our or worship. join us or join us in our worship on Sunday morning that was the genius of Mr. Wesley having small groups as the core of the movement called Methodism and uh, and he was spot on about that and we've experienced it yeah. Yeah. yeah he was spot on about that he was not the better preacher. He was not yeah. the better Bible teacher. But uh, the one who was said, Brother Wesley did so much better, I raised up ropes of sand. Can you imagine trying to tie something with a rope right. of sand? Right. I raised up ropes of sand, children for the devil to slaughter. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for a strong good, encouraging word. But now we need to live it, Lord, and for that especially we need your help. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen.